Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Taya James, and I have had the honor of coordinating the speech showcase this year. I would like to welcome each and every one of you this evening. I'm glad that you are all here. So, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge each of our judges. We have Tim, we have Professor McNamara, we have Kelly, we have Mark, we have Melissa, we have Carol, and we have Brandy. Thank you, each and every one of you, for giving your time and being with us today. Also, I would like to acknowledge any former Speech Showcase contestants. Could you please stand for us? introduce to you our MC for the night, Shander Pardinas. Good evening and welcome to this third year speech showcase. Before we begin, please turn off your cell phones, silence them, or turn them off. We do not want to hear no buzz buzz ring ring. <laughs> And please, while a speaker is up here, do not go out that door for the respect of the speakers this year. And with that said, here's hats off to this year's contestants. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'd first like to welcome Megan Costa. She, her major in college is nursing. She is 19 years young. She is from Centralia, and the topic of her speech is control and hope. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that's not me. <laughs> I'm first. My name is Brett Howard, I'm from New York, Alaska, and my speech is going to be on Obamacare. I don't know where I'm supposed to start. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, we are gathered here tonight to pay homage. Loved by the poor, hated by the rich, having helped many while hurting others, tonight we say, rest in peace, Obamacare. Now I see the looks on y'all's faces. What is this guy talking about? Obamacare? It's a law, how does it die? You're right, it's a law, and it can't die. And it's not dead yet, but the House has voted to repeal it. And tonight, I'm gonna tell you all why Obamacare deserves to die. The first reason Obamacare deserves to die is that it is unsustainable. In 2009, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, said that it was gonna cost $900 billion for the first 10 years of Obamacare. And after that, we would start to save money. If you guys don't know who the CBO is, it is a branch of the government that feeds budget information and economic information to Congress before they make their decisions. So these big wigs, they say that $900 billion for 10 years and it'll save us all this money. In 2016, we had already spent $1.3 trillion on Obamacare, and it was then estimated it was going to be $2.6 trillion by 2023. But is that really that big of a gap? The census showed in 2009, there was 57 million people in America that were uninsured. In 2016, that number had dropped to 20 million. That is 37 million people with health coverage. 93% of the people who get health coverage through Obamacare, it's either reduced or free. Where do you guys think that money comes from? Who's paying for that health coverage? Anybody? We're paying for the health coverage. Um, yes. And on March 30th, 2017, just a few months ago, the CBO, the same guys who said it was going to cost $900 billion for the first 10 years, now said that if the law remains unchanged, 
Our, our government will continue to go in debt indefinitely. It will never pay back the money. We will just continue to dig ourselves a bigger hole. I don't know if you guys know anything about the economy, but when the federal government goes into debt, it stops economic progress. Which leads me into my second point. The second reason that Obamacare deserves to die is that it hurts families. The Kaiser Family Foundation is a nonprofit organization that you know, does studies on health care. In 2017, the average yearly cost for health care for a family of four is $25,000. That's over $1,500 a month. Raise your hand if you have $1,500 a month for health care. <laughs> Dang, I was looking for new parents. <laughs> for, and it's, that's for a family of four. For the, just the normal individual, it's around 17000 which is still huge. But that's okay. It's America. We do what we want, you know? What, I, don't, I don't need health coverage. I barely ever get sick. Obamacare has the individual mandate, which states that if you do not have health care for every month, you are penalized, quote unquote. They can't use the word penalized because that would make it unconstitutional. So they throw in fancy words like tax. You're not, you're not getting charged for not having health care. You're getting taxed for not having health care. Not only did they do that, they made it to where health care no longer has to do with whether you're fit. You look like you're going to the gym. Do you go to the gym? I try. It doesn't matter. <laughs> all all health care cares about now is your age. <clears throat> On Obamacare's website, it states the older you are, you can be charged up to three times more for your health care. Just because you're older. That's it. Now, this has gotten many people looking for a way out. You know, what, what, what are we supposed to do? I can't afford the health care that I require to have, so if I don't have it, I get charged. That leads me into my third point. The third and final reason why Obamacare deserves to die is that there is a substitute or an alternative. Do not boo me out of the room for saying this, but Trump care. Oh, come on. <laughs> now, Trump Care sounds bad, and it has lots of bad media going on with it. But what Trump Care really is, is the response from not only economic information, but the feedback from the entire population of the United States. If you go online and you look, you will see that most of Obamacare's rules and regulations are the same as Trump Care's. The only thing that's different is that Trump Care goes and makes it to where states can choose what and what is not implemented. For instance, the 10 essential benefits, the staple of Obamacare, you know, every healthcare plan in America has to have 10 things on it, like ambulatory service, pregnancy, you know, going on, you can find out. With Trump Care, they leave it up to the states to decide whether or not they're gonna allow health insurance companies to do these things. You, I'm sure all of you have heard the, the whole pre-existing conditions debacle. Everybody has a pre-existing condition. You're born, you breathe air, how could you? What they forget to tell you is that under Trump Care, you, they allow the states to decide. Does anybody here think that a state is going to vote to have their population charged more for pre-existing conditions with health care? If you do, raise your hand. Good, I, I, I kind of side with you. But that's, up, that's our choice. That is up to the state. So, if you guys leave anything here tonight, just remember that it is unsustainable, that it hurts families, and that there is an alternative, be it it has a bad name. So tonight, before you guys all go to bed, I want you all to say just a little prayer for Obamacare, thanking it for everything that it's done and ushering it to where it belongs, the history books. And with that, I thank you. This is actually the number two, Kristen Phillips. She is currently working on her AA, but long-term plan is business. She is 19 years young, and she is from Castle Rock, Washington. And her topic is racism. Let's go. Hi, everybody. So we're gonna start with singing a song. How many of you know the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children? Okay, well, I need you guys to sing it with me. Can we all stand up? 
I'm a bad singer, okay? <laughs> Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. That's it. That's what I just said. <laughs> Thank you. or as I like to call it, race snobbery. I think it's safe to say that it's one of the biggest forms of bullying in the world. I look young, right? How many of you think I could pass for 15? Oh, oh well, okay. <laughs> How many, what about 16? Okay, and 17? A few, okay. Most people think I'm those ages. Um, if I wear enough makeup, I'll get 17 as like my oldest age. I'm about to turn 20. Um, supposedly, I also look Hawaiian, Egyptian, Chinese, and most commonly Hispanic. Trust me, I don't mind any of these. The first week um, of this quarter, I was stopped and asked by random strangers every single day, up to three or four times each day, what my ethnicity was. It was pretty interesting, and um, everybody was really polite about it. Like, people were like, you know what, I was standing over there trying to figure out what you are, but I just decided to come ask you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. Everyone here has been very polite, and I've never been offended, and it's very fortunate. But I'm going to tell you about a story when I was, and I wasn't offended for who I am, but I was offended for a whole other culture. I worked as a cool porter um, for 10 weeks in a program called Youth Rush. And we sold Christian literature door to door. And one day I was, I walked up to a door and I knocked three times and I had a big goofy smile on my face and I was ready to give my sales pitch. And all of a sudden, the door opens and this guy comes out. He's big, intimidating, I'm short so I have to look up at him. But before I can say anything, he stops, looks me up and down, and says, Get out of here, you little Mexican bitch! Grow up and don't ever come back. It's people like you who need to get actual jobs and stop living off of the rest of us. Then he turns around and slides the board. I'm shocked. So let's take a look at what he did. First of all, in my opinion, he was a little sexist. Second of all, he assumed my ethnicity, and he assumed it wrong. I'm half Filipino, half American. And he also used a stereotype. I believe that racism, it doesn't seem like it's ever going to go away. But Change starts with you. And I believe, I'm gonna talk about three ways that I believe each one of you can make a difference wherever you are. So my first main reason or point is to help me put an end to the use of racist terms. Also during that program, we had a buddy system so we'd be safe. Someone would always be across the street from me. And the racist term I heard him being used on him was the term nigger. I, someone didn't open the door where I had knocked and he had been across the street and sometimes we listen in on each other's sales to see how we're doing. <laughs> and I heard someone yelling, get off my porch nigger. You think a black boy like you is good enough to be on my property? This was seriously inhumane. He treated him like he was a homeless dog or something. I believe that racist terms, none of these are necessary. They do more harm than good.
stereotypes. I've sadly heard things being used. Um, there's a name that I can't give out because I know this person and some of you might know him too. Uh, we were driving down the road and he said, all oh, these roads are terrible. Must have been made by those illegal Mexicans. Someone tell them to go back to the country where they came from. I've heard Asians say, these white kids don't know how to study like us. I mean, it may be true. Some, there are pretty elite schools over in Asia where they know how to study pretty good. But that's a stereotype. And what I mean is that it doesn't apply to everybody. And when things don't apply to everybody, it can be offensive. So let's put an end to the use of stereotypes. We want to make friends, not enemies. My third main point, how you can help, is by stop being a snob. <laughs> uh, what I mean by this is that there are people who, uh, I'm going to use an example. She let me, um, Emily Gunzel is from our speech class that I go to. She said that a waiter wouldn't serve her because she was Mexican, because she thought she was an illegal immigrant. This happened to her last year. She wouldn't serve her a glass of water just because the color of her skin. Uh, my boyfriend and his mom were on a mother and son date at a restaurant having a nice time when someone came up to their table and said, what are people like you doing here? So I ask you to think before you speak. We want to make friends, not enemies. So before I go, I have one more story. I hope you guys don't mind. Before I gave this speech for the first time in Jeff's class as a group presentation, I was sitting in the cafeteria on a window seat eating a salad when a bird hits the window. And I'm like, oh. And it starts to fly kind of crookedly, and then it lands in a tree branch. And I'm about to go up and help it, and then it just gets up and starts flying, and it goes off the branch, just drops out of the air. So I'm about to go out there and help it. When I'm stopped in my tracks, another bird, a blue jay, flies out of nowhere, pins that little bird to the ground, and starts pegging at its eyeball. <coughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness. So I go up there, I'm all dressed up, I'm in my heels ready for the presentation, and I'm, I'm going like this, and I'm like, get out of here, and I'm yelling at the Blue Jay. And so I get out there, and I pick it up, and its eyeballs are pecked out, but it's still alive. So I hold it for about a minute before it dies in my hands. And then I go set in a clump of grass where it looks like it won't be mowed. So my point to this story is that if you had seen someone being picked on for their age, their gender, or their race, would you have stopped and helped? What would you have done? And what would you do? I found a quote on Google that says, the only thing that should be sorted by color is your laundry. And with that, I thank you. <laughs>
God or the divine? Look at our history, people. Those are where the facts lie. So who here feels uncomfortable? Maybe like I got in your bubble? No one likes to feel the way that we all feel right now. Angry, confused, intimidated, and especially uncomfortable. My name is Andy Rose, and my speech today provides a crucial message. We need to stop pushing our religious beliefs onto each other. The be like me mentality does not work. Before I show you all my three main reasons behind this, I could really use your help. When I say be like me, you respond with is not the key. Let's practice. Be like me is not the key. You guys are awesome. First reason, it creates world problems. Second, it harms relationships. And third, it causes closed-mindedness. So let's look at the first reason as to why be like me is not the key. Awesome. It's because it creates world problems. A fallacy is a deceptive argument that even when proven false becomes a use of persuasion. In 2006, Owen Williamson, a lecturer with a master's degree in professional writing and rhetoric, compiled the master list of 135 logical fallacies. The ninth fallacy listed was the appeal to heaven fallacy. This states that one person or nation interprets their God's will as their own. ISIS is a great example. Those in membership, however, see what they do as a necessary evil to achieve their goals. The goal of ISIS is to create a caliphate, an Islamic state ruled through Sharia law under the rule of the caliph. Those who do not strictly adhere by that law are either stoned, hanged, beheaded, and that's just to name a few. In 2014, it was estimated that about 20,000 fighters had joined the cause of ISIS. These types of issues have torn our world apart on a large scale, but also in relationships. This brings me to my second reason as to why be like me is not the key. It's because it harms relationships. Now I would like you all to take a minute and look at someone nearby you. Could be someone sitting next to you. Could be someone across the room. Go ahead, take a minute. Now imagine that person is someone you love, care for, would do anything for. Now, know that person cannot feel the same way about you. Their religious beliefs prevent them. You are on a one-way street, constantly chasing someone who will not meet you in the middle. Justine. This is my friend Justine. She's an incredible woman who keeps her mind open and ready to receive new information. Justine was raised in a strict Mormon household, going back about three generations. She began to realize that she didn't believe what her family believed in. The day that she decided to tell her grandmother that she no longer wanted to attend church, all hell broke loose. That was about six years ago. And to this day, she has to hide who she is under a bed when her parents come to visit. She takes her stones, meditation utensils, tarot cards, and shoves them under a bed for fear of ridicule from her family. She then met my husband and I. After one night of being with us, she looked at me and said, thank you. I have finally found a safe place. This was because my husband and I remained open-minded and ready to receive any new information she wanted to share with us. Thank you, Justine. This leads me to my third main reason as to why be like me is not the key. It's because it causes closed-mindedness. There are religions such as Mormons and Jehovah's Witness who take their message door to door. J.D. Roth, a writer for GetRichSlowly.org, stated that those who sell door to door use high pressure tactics and prey on the fear and ignorance of others. Their message would be better received if those preaching and the ones listening were open-minded to the subject matter. When my mother was in Hawaii during her high school years, she was just walking down the street and a Jehovah's Witness was preaching. He looked at her and said, hi there, can I give you a flower and let me tell you about my God? She politely declined. And when she went to walk past, he blocked her way. She finally was able to force, pass, force her way by 
And he looked at her and said, well, fine, just take the flower, and shoved it in her hair. This flower was attached to a bobby pin. You can imagine the bruise my mom had on her head. To this day, anytime someone comes to our door, she cringes in fear that it's a Jehovah's Witness. Folks, this should not be the case. If that one witness respected my mother's boundaries, stepped back and said, have a wonderful day, my mom would have no problem when someone comes to our door and remain open-minded about what they are going to talk about. So the other end of the spectrum, religious beliefs unite people. You would be correct. But after a while, that unity becomes uniformity. So let's review. I was here today to share with you why be like me is not the key when it comes to pushing our religious beliefs onto each other. The first reason was it creates world problems. I used ISIS and the appeal to heaven fallacy as a strong example. My second was it harms relationships. And thanks to Justine and her story, I was able to bring that point home. My third reason, it causes closed-mindedness. I brought up the story about my mother and how if that witness would have stepped back and respected her boundaries, she would have no problem remaining open-minded when someone comes to the door. So why am I here? Stop with the be like me mentality. Be like you, the strong, individual, caring, open-minded human beings that you are. Do this by researching the multitude of different religions out there and decide for yourself where your boundaries and the boundaries of others may lie. A lack of boundaries invites a lack of respect. And remember, be like me, it's not the key. And with that, I thank you. Her topic is gun rights. She is 17 years old and her 19 years old and uh, she is from Toledo, Washington. Let's go. Revolutionary War. And my grandfather fought in World War II, and who is here today watching me give this speech. And my dad fought in the Vietnam War. We defend ourselves and our country. Can I please have my grandpa stand up? <laughs> and it's all good. Ignorant, selfish, and cruel people. 
We all have heard about the shootings in public schools, streets, and so forth all over the country. When we hear the word shooting, most people say guns are dangerous. We shouldn't have them at all. Take them away. Take them all away. Guns kill people. Guns do not kill people. People kill people. Guns are not the problem in this world. It's the people. Guns are not the only thing that can be used to kill. If they take away everything that kills, you become defenseless, you get taken advantage of, and you, you lose the right to protect yourself. Guns, once again, are not the problem in this world. It's the people. How they are used, except the person <coughs> holding them. My three main points are defense, equalizer, and less crime. My first main point is defense. We all want to protect ourselves from any harm. That is our human instinct. We do not want to get hurt or see others be hurt. We defend ourselves by using our body, a gun, a knife, a bat, or simply anything that we can get a hold of. People should have the right to own guns. We have the right to defend ourselves, our home, and our family. I am well within my rights to shoot someone who breaks into my home and tries to harm me or my family. Government defense. We, the people, are the reason why we have governments. The Second Amendment in the Constitution, the right to bear arms, that right helps us keep the government in check. Without gun rights, we are powerless. Our voice is nothing. The government rules us and we we get taken advantage of. I was at Fiddler's on February 11, 2017. Four officers walked in and sat on a table by me. I was working on my persuasive speech that day on gun rights. And seeing them gave me an idea. So I walked up to them and asked them what their opinions on gun rights and gun control was. Two officers said, use both hands. <laughs> <laughs> Jim E. Shannon agreed to be interviewed. I asked him a couple of questions, and he said, the gun is a tool. The use depends on the person. My gun has 24 parts. It throws a small piece of lead really fast. You can't attach morality to that. People have the right to bear arms. It's constitutional. The people's right to bear arms keeps the government in check. The founders of our country believe that the people have the right to defend themselves against the government, just as important as defending themselves against a grizzly bear. Jim E. Shannon also said, I have been a cop for 32 years, I was in SWAT for 22 years, and I was a SWAT leader for six years. Out of many situations where I used my gun, rarely did I have to fire it. Presence alone was enough to resolve the situation. And that leads me to my second main point, equalizer. Guns are an equalizer if we all own and carry the gun to protect ourselves. In 1975, Ronald Reagan wrote, the gun has been called the great equalizer, meaning that a small person with a gun is equal to a large person. But it is a great equalizer in another way too. It ensures that the people are the equal of their government whenever that government forgets that it is servant and not the master of the government. And to my third and final point, less crime. Almost every mass shooting that has occurred in the United States since 1950 has taken place in a state with strict gun control laws. A study published in the Harvard Law of Journal in Public and Policy discovered that nations that have more guns tend to have less crime. For example, in 1982, Tunisia, Georgia passed a law requiring heads of households to own at least one firearm with ammunition. After this law was passed, the city saw a huge plunge in crime rates. I believe if more people, ideally everyone, owned and carried a gun, there would be a decrease in the number of deaths in a year. Everyone, even criminals, are going to think twice 
We're trying to kill someone who is armed and loaded. An armed and prepared person is much less likely to be targeted as a victim as opposed to someone unarmed. My three main points were defense, equalizer, and less firm. We have the right to defend ourselves. That is our human right. Guns are an equalizer, meaning that a small person with a gun is equal to a large person. Crime rates will decrease if we all own and carry the gun to protect ourselves. So today, I want to leave you with one thing. Guns are not the problem in this world. It's the people. And with that, I thank you. And now our fifth and for now final speaker is Michael Geary. He is 18 years old and his topic is the condemnation of creative teaching. That's one. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to open with a sort of an ethical question. Where do we draw the line between acceptable deviance and unacceptable deviance? For example, if a journalist leaks incriminating evidence against his or her own government, is this an act of free speech or is it treason? If an artist goes out and spray paints a beautiful mural on a wall without obtaining permission first, is this art or is it now an act of vandalism? You can see that the line is blurred. This is the case with most, if not all, controversial topics. But I am here today to discuss education in particular. If a teacher adapts his or her curriculum to meet individual students' needs and help them succeed both on a personal and educational basis, is this a sign of compassion for the student or an act of disobedience against the system? Well, I think you and I would be able to arrive at the same answer to this question. And you might be wondering, how could this stir controversy? It sounds like the perfect classroom environment. Well, unfortunately, this approach to education, which I like to call creative teaching, has been under attack by the system for decades. My name is Heiko Geary, and I'm here today to persuade you not only that creative teaching is not an act of disobedience, it is single-handedly the most effective way to form stronger bonds between student and teacher and higher rates of success for either party. So to get us started, I would like to ask you, how many of you have had a favorite teacher who stands out to you personally? Just about every one of us. If I were to ask you to describe some of the qualities of this teacher, what would you have to say? Kind. Kind. Engaging. Sorry? Engaging. Engaging, That's absolutely. Supportive. supportive. These are all wonderful answers, but you may notice these are human traits. They don't have to do with curriculum. These have to do with people, which leads me to the problem. Teachers can actually be punished for making their own decisions about how best to teach their students because they're so limited by the system. My best examples of this exact scenario are actually my mom and dad. When I was about three years old, we moved to Washington and my mom got a job at an elementary school in Seattle teaching special needs children. My dad started working here in town at Centralia High School teaching English as a second language to students from foreign countries. When I reached the right age, I started attending the same elementary school that my mom was teaching at. Well, the school being 40 miles away, I spent most every school day in her classroom as she worked away furiously in her office. As far back as I can remember, it would be 2.30 when I got out of class, but it'd be nighttime before I got home. And at that time, I was too young. I didn't understand her dedication to her work. But as I got older, I grew to respect it. The papers in her office were piled high on every open location, and I found her asleep at her desk more times than I could count. She paid for her multitudes of specialized classroom supplies out of her own pocket for years. My point being, her students and her work were her passion, her life, and the results showed. She quickly became respected as one of the most talented special needs teachers in the entire school district. So what went wrong? Well. The one event that turned the district against my mother was a simple misunderstanding. 
Her boss had decided to remove a paraeducator from her team who had been assisting with a particularly difficult student. However, the parents of the student were not made aware of the change. Unknowingly, my mom expressed concern about this decision in conversation with the parents. They were very understandably upset that their child lost a personal assistant without them being consulted first. This placed the school in an extremely precarious situation with the parents, and the district took direct issue with my mother. Ever since the incident, she was treated differently. She was placed under heavy scrutiny and examination, and forced to report all classroom data to her higher-ups constantly, even threatened dismissal from her position if she did not comply. I watched the passion for her work drain out of her as the school continued to treat her like a criminal for no reason. After a couple years of this treatment, she left the job. My dad's story bears a startling resemblance to the one that I've just shared. His approach to teaching English to teenagers with no concept of the language was to target their interests and treat them like family. I got, I got the opportunity to watch him in his classroom on a couple of occasions when I was very, very young, and I must say, it didn't feel much like a classroom at all in the sense that all these high school kids were really enjoying themselves. <laughs> On a couple of occasions, he would even allow them to watch TV in class, like sports or game shows, provided the programming was in English. And this worked. He had the ability to make anything a learning opportunity, and he stood out of the crowd because of it. He treated high school students with a level of respect and admiration that created bonds as strong as family. From the time he taught at Centralia High School, to this day, his students will show up at our house and ask him for advice. Whether it be help fixing a car, getting a job, even family and relationship troubles. And I believe this is the key to driving students to love education. This has nothing to do with what curriculum is being taught at all. So, what happened? Well. His forgiving approach to testing earned him his share of scrutiny from the school system. And as they continued to criticize his methods, he too was determined to quit the job. He left Centralia High School, discouraged and exhausted by the politics of the system. I cannot imagine a worse crime than robbing students of passionate teachers. Because an excellent teacher can be life-changing for a student. Every student deserves a teacher who is teaching on a, founded on a love for teaching, not because of federally mandated test results alone. So I implore you, please, be aware of the struggles of our public school teachers. They are paid just enough to survive, they're disrespected, they're taken for granted. So if I'm going to leave you with one thing, I would like to borrow some words from one of history's excellent speakers. Perhaps it is time to ask not what our teachers can do for us, but what we can do for our teachers. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed your refreshments and bathroom break. Now we would like to welcome the sixth speech contestant. Um, Abigail Scott, her major is in business management. She is 38 years old, and she currently lives in Toledo, but was from Seattle. Seattle. Death at your front door. Dun, dun, dun. Hi, I'm Abby, and I'm a domestic violence warrior. I choose this title because I'm done being a victim. I have survived three abusive relationships, and I'm here today to talk to you about that. Now, to me, a domestic violence warrior is someone who pledges to help in times of struggle or conflict in domestic violence situations. 11 years ago, 
I was in my second marriage, and I found out that my husband was cheating on me. I confronted him about this, pleaded with him to work through it with me because we are married. We took vows till death do us part. As our voices rose out on the front porch, we decided to take it inside. As the door closed behind me, my husband turned with fire in his eyes. He grabbed me by my neck, and the last thing that I remember is my feet leaving the floor beneath me. I'm here today because I want all of you to become domestic violence warriors. Because domestic violence has become a, a norm in our culture, victims need a hero, and you can save a life. So let's talk about my first point. Statistics from the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence show that one in four women and one in seven men are victims of physical abuse in their lifetime. Can you guys do me an honor and raise your hand if you've been involved in a domestic violence situation or you know somebody that has? Look around you. It's a lot of hands. This is creating a culture of one-uppers, right? You know the type. Oh, you should have seen what happened to my aunt last Christmas at the table. Or, he deserved that. Did you hear the way he talked to her? Or better yet, at least you're not dead like the woman at the end of the block. This is something that has to change. It's become too normal in our culture. Let's then move on to my second main point. And that's that victims need a hero. Now, the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence is out there. We have local agencies like the Human, it's not Resource Network, Response, Response Network, thank you, available to us. Some victims like myself have a hard time reaching out to resources like that. I had a hero, her name was Jen Reed. She was a good friend of mine. She lived about a half hour away from me and she made it to my house in nine minutes flat. She helped me go through the paperwork, the court dates, the emotions, the negative opinions of everybody around me. But what about a person that doesn't have a hero? Our friends, our family, and our neighbors need us. So let's move on to my third main point. You could save a life. Now I told you the last thing that I remember was my feet leaving the floor. The very next thing I remember is my husband shaking me awake. Abby, Abby, are you okay? I woke up swinging for my life, kicking, screaming at the top of my lungs. Help! Somebody help me! Screaming. Enough to the point where he got scared and finally left. When my neighbors were questioned, did you hear a commotion going on next door? Yes. Did you hear your neighbor Abby screaming for help? Yes. Did you call the police or go over to help her? No. Why not? <coughs> we figured we'd wait until she came out to smoke a cigarette. I almost died at my front door. Please, don't be like my neighbor. I've given you three great reasons to become domestic violence warriors. It's become way too common in our culture. Victims need a hero. And you 
can save lives. So today, for your first step towards becoming a domestic violence hero or warrior, I'm going to ask that you please turn to somebody next to you and tell them, don't be Abby's neighbor. You ready? One, two, three. Don't be Abby's neighbor. And with that, I thank you. is Lauren Davis and she is pursuing theater as her major. She is 19 years old and her topic is political correctness and its effect on today's society in America. Lane. By show of hands, how many of you in this room have used one of these words at least once in your lifetime? Well, congratulations. You can now all consider yourselves socially inept, racist, sexist bigots. That's a good way to start off my speech. I'm really going to win this one. <laughs> so I think that we can all agree that these are words that we use on a daily basis. These are all harmless aren't they? You may be surprised to find out that in his video, 30 words and phrases that are simply wrong, Gavin McInnes quotes several media platforms, including CNN and MSNBC, which state that these words, criminal, thug, hard work, bossy, lame, are no longer considered PC. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, PC stands for politically correct, or political correctness. And basically the idea of it, to give you guys a rundown, is that it is an intentionally progressive movement, which is, encompasses the ideal that everyone and everything is treated with respect, dignity, kindness, regardless of race, gender, gender identity, sexuality, anything. Everyone is treated with kindness, which is great. That's something we should all strive for. And yet, in the past few years, this intentionally progressive movement has become regressive. Being PC is an American tragedy, and by the end of my speech today, I will have convinced you why. In April of 2016, there was a woman by the name of Leslie Jones who starred in uh, the more recent Ghostbusters movie. Now, she got a lot of backlash in this film. Um, a lot of people felt that she wasn't doing a very good job, so they voiced her, their opinions. And Leslie Jones, as it is within her right to freedom of speech, said via Twitter, complained via Twitter that she didn't agree with these people giving her hate mail. OK, that's fine. Milo Yiannopoulos, who is a fairly well-known uh, public speaker, responded to one of her tweets with, quote, if you don't succeed because your work is terrible, play the victim. Everyone gets hate mail. OK, that's not exactly nice. And it's definitely something that I wouldn't personally tell one of my uh, rivals. <laughs> However, it is within his right to freedom of speech, just as it was within Leslie Jones's right to say what she felt, for him to criticize her. However, on the grounds of being racist, because of this tweet, Milo, <laughs> Milo Yiannopoulos was permanently banned from Twitter on the grounds of being racist. PC culture encourages conformity. We don't all have the same opinions, and that's, the great, that's, so, that's so, so great about being an American, is that we can have these different opinions. We're allowed to state them. PC culture has made that 
extremely difficult. Being PC is an American tragedy. Now you're thinking, okay, well, I don't really have a Twitter. I'm not really on the internet. This doesn't really affect me. Okay. Take this into consideration. Political correctness is endangering our safety. PC culture has resulted in the regression of our justice system. In October of 2016, a female officer was nearly beaten to death by a man. When they took her to the hospital, she had bone splints in her shoulders. Her wrists and neck were horribly injured. And yet, at, during the time that she was being beaten, she was in full grasp of her gun. Why didn't she protect herself? Why? Why? When asked this question when she was in her hospital bed, she said that she was too scared of the political backlash that would come with her pulling her gun on a black man. Can you imagine being more willing to die than face political backlash? If our officers are too scared to protect themselves, how can we expect them to protect us? Being PC is an American tragedy. Now I'm going to wrap up with a personal story. And it involves an Olympia Initiative One. Olympia Initiative One was proposed in October of 2016. And the basic idea was that anyone in the Olympia area who made an income of $200,000 or more um, would, be tr would be taxed 1.5%. Now this money would go to kids who could not afford college and it would be paying for their college one year out of high school. Which on paper, that sounds great. But then you start thinking, okay, this affects people who have already paid for their kids to go to college. This affects people who don't have kids, who will never have kids. <coughs> this affects people like my father. My father is an extraordinary man. He started at rock bottom, and today I'm proud to say that he is the HR director at the Attorney General's office. He was raised in poverty, on food stamps, with nine other siblings. All of his brothers have gone to jail. My father is the only person in his family who paid his way through college. He worked two jobs. He helped his family after their, their house burned down. My father is an extraordinary man, and he is helping me pay for my, for my college today, and I'm extremely blessed. Now let's, let me tell you about my Uncle Noel. My Uncle Noel is a felon. He's a drug dealer. He stole the identity of his own brother after he passed away to steal his money. And he will sit there all day and brag about he steals how he steals money from all of you and does nothing. He has not worked for years. And the government, who you pay, pays him to sit on his butt all day. He will talk to you for hours about that. Olympia Initiative One would be paying for children like my uncle Noel's children to go to college. I love my cousins. But it's not fair. My father came from the same exact background and he's being forced to pay for someone else's ch child. Someone who has done nothing for his children. Being PC is an American tragedy. Please, don't let it be yours. With that, I thank you. Speaker number eight is Megan Costa, and she is 19 years old. Her major in college is nursing, and she is from Centralia. The topic of her speech is control and choice. Control and choice. These are two words that we so often in our lives, we tend to separate them. And today I'll be showing you the relationship between the two. I'll be taking you on a bit of a journey through the things that we can control 
the things that we cannot, and ultimately, why asking the question, why has this happened to me, is ultimately destructive in the face of pain. Now, how many of you have asked this question, why, before? I'm guessing most of us have, right? All right. But what I'm here today to tell you is that ultimately this question is abused by all of us. <coughs> we use it as a diversion in the face of our pain when a difficulty occurs to have this endless search for what the reasons why something's happened to us, how it happened, when deep down we know that we'll never find that final answer. We will never find resolution in asking the question, why? Now, where did this stem from? Well, it stems from our lack of control. So many things we are powerless to stop. Things like sickness, death, friends abandoning us. I'm sure most of us have sadly experienced those things as well. So, what is our natural tendency? Our natural tendency is to study that painful event and to hold ourselves back there in this question of why, when our focus must ultimately be in our reaction. Our reaction is what we control. This is what is so powerful. We have the power to change the most influential part of our lives, and that is ourselves. We have the power to be proactive in the face of difficulty. Now, if we really take the time to examine that concept alone, I could give you a 10-minute speech. But what I'm here today to show you is that this is where our focus should be. That what we control, we must also take responsibility for. Now, this is ultimately the reason why, in our search for control, we, we end up running away from the very thing we're searching for. We all want the power to change things around us. This seems, if we had the power to change everything, we would. But, in the words of the great Uncle Ben from Spider-Man, with great power also comes great responsibility, correct? Well, this leads us back to this conflict. Do we want control or do we not? Well, it seems that life would choose for us most of the time, yes? Well, this is where we go back to our action in the face of difficulty. I will never know the reason why one of my best friends no longer speaks to me anymore. I will never know the reason why I had to say goodbye to two uncles within months of each other this year. What I could do is consistently examine the process of how this happened, how it could have been present, uh, prevented, or I can recognize what I was responsible for. I can recognize the things that I had the power to change, things like telling my uncles how much I loved them before it was too late. Things like telling my friend how much I loved her before she decided to leave. These are things that we can change. These are the things that we have power over. But the question is not, why does the difficulty come? The question is, are we willing to take the responsibility for the circumstances surrounding those difficulties that we do control? One of my favorite stories that has to do with, with this topic is the story of Andrea Bocelli. I don't know how many of you know him, but I was raised with his voice in my house. And when I was little, my mom ended up showing me his first film, which was A Night in Tuscany, and it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I, I rewatch it all the time. But I was, I was about seven or eight when this happened, and I noticed that uh, Mr. Bocelli sang with his eyes closed all, all throughout the entire evening. And I asked my mother why this was, and she said, well, that's because Mr. Bocelli is blind. He cannot see, and he thinks it's less distracting to his audience if he simply closes his eyes and lets them hear his voice. So this year, I had the chance to actually research him and really come deeper into his story. And what I found was that at one point in his life, 
Andrea Bocelli could see. He had very limited vision. But he had several operations, numerous ones, when he was 11, uh, up until the age of 11. Then he decided to play a game of soccer. And it was in this game that he discovered that, excuse me, in, in the middle of the game, the ball ended up hitting him directly in his right eye. And this was the only th way he could see light and color. It was a hemorrhage, and it was a terrible emergency, and within a few days, he was completely blind at the age of 12. Well, it took all of three weeks for Andrea to look at his mother. He said, this is where my focus went. I saw my mother in her greatest grief, which was for her son. And he said, right then I knew I had to take it upon myself to do the only thing within my power, which obviously had nothing to do with his sight anymore. He was powerless to renew or dwell on that. But he said, I can make my mother happy. I can show her that I have a passion for living still. I can show her that this will only make me stronger. And through that, he decided that he would go on and pursue his musical talent. He was successful in high school and college. He even studied law and graduated from law school before receiving his break in the opera world. So I think it's people like this that we can look at and we can know for certain, as it's proved out, that studying our problems never lead to the solution. But studying the proper solution just might help us move on from the problem. So, bringing you all back to the objective, to why I'm here tonight, once again, is to show you how valuable this is. But once you realize how valuable it is, I hope you all know how much responsibility that entails. That if you are, if you have the ability to change something, you also become responsible for its success or its failure. Now, this can be either terrifying or it can be exciting, but I strongly encourage you not to run away from those things you can change because we all have the power to change them for the better and we're all responsible to make the effort to change them for the better. We cannot dissociate ourselves from those things that perhaps we don't want to be responsible for the failure, so we choose to do nothing. Like we said, we don't want to be Abby's neighbor. So with that, I thank you all so much for your time. Speaker number nine, Emma Sturr. Her major is She is 19 years old, and her topic is the value of life. Let's welcome her. troublesome to you, annoying, in the way of your reputation, your plans for the future, and your happiness. Now what if I told you that I know someone who can get rid of that person for you? Someone who would willingly murder that person for you? Anyone here would consider this an option? <coughs> but the reality is, this happens every day. This happens to children every day. Every day, thousands upon thousands of babies are killed because they're troublesome, unwanted and in the way. Abortion. Abortion kills 900,000 unborn babies each year in the United States alone. We must take action against this plague of destruction. Abortion should be abolished because it negates and destroys the most valuable gift, life. Abortion should be abolished because it kills the lives of unborn babies. It hurts women psychologically and emotionally, and it threatens the future of the United States. My first point is that it kills unborn babies. Now some of you might be thinking, but it's just a cell inside of a woman. It's not a human baby yet. This cannot be further from the truth. Because scientifically, fertilization begins the life of a human being, and abortion kills that human being. 
Dr. Keith Moore, a highly respected embryologist, affirms that human development begins at fertilization. When the male gamete combines with the female gamete, this union produces a zygote, a highly specialized cell marking the beginning of a genetically unique human individual. The zygote is not a normal body cell because it's genetically distinct from both parents. The science of embryology confirms that abortion does kill the unborn. Some of you still might be thinking, but at such an early stage of development, the zygote is still completely dependent on a woman for survival. It couldn't survive on its own. How can abortion kill unborn babies? Let's look at this in a different perspective. Dependency does not measure the value of a human being. Before my grandma died, she was in the hospital on life support. She couldn't do anything for herself, breathe, eat, drink. She was fully dependent on her family and her nurses to keep her alive. I ask you, did my grandma's dependency in any way diminish her value as a human being? Judges? No. I'm sure we can all agree that my grandma's life was just as valuable as she could care for herself. It's the same with the unborn. Their dependency on their mothers for survival does not determine their value as human being because, as, as I said, dependency does not measure the value of human life. My second point is that abortion hurts women psychologically and emotionally. It is true that abortion can bring temporary relief to women who feel unprepared to raise a child, but when the reality that they've actually murdered their own child really sinks in, they're going to carry that with them for the rest of their life. And multiple studies do confirm that abortion hurts women psychologically. A case study in 2011 found that compared to women who gave birth, women who had an abortion experienced an 81% increase in mental health issues, including depression, substance abuse, suicidal inclinations, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And personal accounts from women themselves confirm that it hurts them emotionally. And last minute, with 18 years of practice as a post-abortion grief counselor, expressed the grief she felt after she had two abortions herself. She said, abortion is a result of love loss. We do not grieve over losing someone unless they have value to our life which shows that the unborn must have value to the life of their mothers. After years of counseling, grieving women, she stated, quote, it is almost as if two people die on the surgical table, one physically and one spiritually and emotionally, end quote. My final point is that abortion threatens the future of the United States. Under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, the unborn have been defined as non-persons. However, law officials have noted that the Supreme Court has extended the definition of personhood to corporations, though corporations share none of the characteristics we see in a human person. I pose to you that if the Supreme Court can extend the definition of personhood to include a corporation, can they not also extend this definition to the unborn that share far more similarities to a human person than any corporation. <coughs> the Supreme Court can't extend this definition. They have just chosen not to do so. And this choice proves threatening to future generations. Because as of right now, the definition of a person is indefinite. I'd like you to turn to the person next to you and ask them, what, what is a person? What is the definition of person? Turn to the person next to you. <laughs> and now, I'd like to ask you, did you have the exact same definition of a person as the person beside you? No. This just shows there is no definite definition. You cannot know. And therefore, since there is no definition, the future threatens infants, the physically and mentally disabled, the brain injured, the elderly, those with incurable deadly diseases, because they could also be categorized as non-persons and denied the constitutional right to life. In conclusion, I came here today to persuade you that abortion should be abolished because it negates and destroys life by killing the lives of unborn babies. 
hurting women psychologically and emotionally, and threatening the future of our nation. Fortunately, we can take action against abortion. My challenge for each of you today is to promote life. First, by respecting everyone, because all people at all stages of life are valuable. And two, to go and research for yourself the organizations that promote life and support women, such as the Possibilities Pregnancy Center here in Centralia, so that if you ever encounter a woman who's had an abortion, or a woman who is considering one, that you can offer them help and alternative options. And above all else, please remember that all life is equally valuable and it is our duty to defend the innocent children who cannot yet defend themselves. And with that, I thank you. And our final contestant of the night is Peyton Gift. She is 17 years old. She is from Chehalis, Washington, and her topic is More Peace, Less War. on war. And hi, my name is Hayden Gish. <laughs> well, war is a pretty heavy subject, and that song I sang to you just a moment ago displays it. That song was the song War by Edwin Starr. It was a protest song against the Vietnam War. Now, before I give you the statistic, I just want to say I respect my veterans very much, and I thank you so much for saving our country. Are there any veterans in the audience today? Yeah. Thank you so much. Now, moving on to that, I'm going to be talking about civilian casualties. You, fine gentlemen, made the great decision to, de to defend our country, and I thank you so much for that decision. But civilians often don't get the choice in whether they live or die. Now, in the Vietnam War, 430,000 civilians died. To put that into perspective for you, I'd like to tell you the max occupancy of Safeco Field is 47,943 people. Enough civilians perished in the Vietnam War that it could fill up that stadium over eight and a half times. That's a pretty heavy statistic. Well, it's the truth. So, I'd like you all to imagine for a moment, use the old noodle, think. Now, what is a reasonable number of civilian deaths? There are no right or wrong answers. I'd just like you to be honest with yourself and think of it. Okay, now that you've got that, I'd like to move on to my first main reason. My first main reason for you to rethink your stance on war are innocent lives. I believe every life is substantial and can craft the world in a way that they can't think of. Who knows? Maybe you can change the world. Maybe you can as well. Well, now I'd like you to refer back to that number you just created in your mind a second ago. That number represents innocent lives lost in war conflicts. They were mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, husbands. Now I'd like you to think of that number as not people who die in a conflict overseas that you do not know of or know them personally. I'd like you to try and fill that number up with everyone you know. And maybe some of you thought of a number that's too big and you don't even know that many people. But for a lot of innocent people, this is their life day to day. They lose irreplaceable people. And to them, that's not just a casualty, and that's not just a statistic. Now, according to medac.org, right now there's a civil war in Syria, as many of you may know. But according to medac.org, the rates of the Syrian section have gone up because mothers are afraid to give birth in wartime. They want to save their children, so they instead have their baby taken out. Many people are, or many women who do this are dying because rolling power outages in hospitals are keeping them, that, 
the power is keeping them alive causes them to die because there are power outages or there are bombings. And also for the first time in 53 years in Syria, the infant, in, uh, the infant mortality rate is up. Now, when I first saw this, I was pretty happy. And before you go and think I'm a monster, trust me, I am definitely not for the death of infant children. But I was so happy because I got so lucky. I am so lucky to be born here in the right place in the right time. But unfortunately for infants in Syria, they are just born in the wrong place at the wrong time through no fault of their own. Now on to my next main reason, the planet. War can devastate the environment, and some of these problems are irreversible. Well, according to the Union of World Conservation, there's a quote by its chief scientist that says, we are now more than ever prone to the destruction of our own civilization. Now, this refers to in war conflicts, people's homes are getting destroyed, and sometimes it's people from that country destroying their neighbor's homes because they think they're right. Well, because of this destruction, there is mass migration of people. And when there is a mass migration of people, it puts a stress on another area because their home is no longer good to live in, so they have to move somewhere else. This can put an enormous strain on the area that they go to, both economically and environmentally. Now, on to my next point, the fact that we can do it. Now, I'm going to say something. World peace is achievable. And maybe I'm an optimist, but sue me, I'm an optimist. I believe that world peace is achievable because we have all the ingredients to make it. One of the ingredients is the United Nations. The United Nations is a platform where countries from all over the world can communicate their ideals. Now, as on their official website, the United Nations state that their main purpose is to restore national and world peace and have good communication and respect among nations. Well. We have this great platform. Let's use it to the best of our extent. Let's have open communication between countries because it could save millions of lives. My next reason is that we all want a better future. Please, at this moment, stand up if you want to leave the world better off than the way you found it. Okay. You guys all want to make the world a better place, and that's amazing. And all of us in this room can make such an impact. Thank you. Sit down. <laughs> we can all make such a great impact, and all of us together, we can achieve peace. Now, I'd like to recap. Today, I came here to persuade you to rethink your stance on war. And whether you agree with me or not is not the issue. But the issue is, is we all need to take action for what we believe in. Now, I dare you, I double dog dare you, go out, do research, find out what you believe, and then use it to better the world. Again, whether you agree with me or not, trust me, my feelings won't get hurt. I want you to go out and make the world a better place with your beliefs, because we can all do it and we can all have a great impact. And with that, I thank you. Top 10 speakers on stage. Right now.
Hold on, Pat. Keep them all up there. Okay, so as they are sitting, I'd like to announce the audience choice speaker, which is Andy Rose. Please. Guy Hart. <laughs> 